Welcome everybody to the uh, NGEHT session, parallel session number one, um, NGEHT architecture and design. Uh, I'm your moderator, Jonathan Weintraub from the Center for Astrophysics. We have LSD support from Lindy Blackburn and Nick Conroy. Thanks very much to them. And uh, uh, Gopal, you can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, our first speaker is Gopal Naranyan uh, from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst uh, in the United States. And his talk is entitled uh, 23345 gigahertz dual frequency NGHD receiver prototype for the LMT, the Large Millimeter Telescope. So uh, please go ahead, Gopal. Uh, eight minutes to talk, two for questions, six minute warning. Thank you, Jono. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, today I thought I'd cover uh, the idea of a dual frequency receiver for the LMT. Uh, purpose built for the next generation EHT. And uh, th this work is being carried out in our labs at UMass uh, and uh, listed are the names of people involved. Uh, Sandra Bustamante is a graduate student working with us on this as well. Um, so um, the motivation for such a dual frequency receiver for the EHT, um, primarily it is that when you do multi-frequency synthesis observations simultaneously, at two different wavelengths like this, uh, it can give you a significant boost in sensitivity and also the angular resolution. And um, to illustri illustrate that on the right-hand side at the bottom, we show some of the simulations of just uh, observing a black hole, an M87-like black hole with a jet, uh, observe at the EHT 2017 array, but then compare it against what the NGHT can do alongside with uh, the 345 gigahertz observations thrown in. You notice, first of all, you get a spectacular better angular resolution, but you're also able to resolve the jet as well. Um, the, the idea that we've had uh, with the MSRI, the NSF funded uh, proposal, uh, is that we would build this dual frequency receiver and deploy the LMT as a prototype for other telescopes uh, for the NGHT. Uh, I will note that while 850 micron VLBI is still challenging, it has been demonstrated with the EHT at this point, uh, FPT, the frequency phase transfer technique can be used and that could be probably helpful with, um, when you have a lower coherence times at these higher frequencies, you can transfer from lower frequencies to higher frequencies. And the LMT being a large aperture will form a very valuable anchor station for this set of synthesis. So what are we trying to do? Uh, this is a broad, architectural view of uh, what the, the receiver would look like. It's a dual frequency receiver uh, with a single beam looking out of the sky. A diplexer will split the uh, one millimeter photons from the 850 micron photon and each frequency is um, dual polarization receiver, sideband separation with the noise temperatures uh, specified as uh, shown. Uh, there are about five to six times quantum limited for both receivers. And uh, you'll simultaneously obtain all these bands. So you get eight IF frequency bands, each which is of which is four to 12 gigahertz wide. And it's gonna be fully remote controlled and face locked at, for both LOs. And the idea is, is that this is, so serves as a prototype for NGHT. So we want to make this completely, all parts are controllable from remotely. And also for NGHT purposes and for the LMT pointing, we are building a beam chopper that would be used for pointing and focus observations with this receiver. So the 230 gigahertz band of this tube uh, is well at hand. And part of it is uh, the, the, the reason why it's well at hand is because we already have uh, SIS junctions, superconducting junctions that can be used for this band. Uh, at UMass, we've had a project called Omaya, which is a array receiver for the LMT. And through that collaboration, we have large numbers of junctions and shown on the right-hand side are uh, current versus voltage IV curves and uh, a histogram of some of the uh, resistances that you obtain on the junctions. And so this gives you a fairly good idea that the 230 gigahertz band, we have lots of junctions to use. And uh, the, the, the mixer itself is a novel new arrangement and uh, it in a single block will comp comprise the ortho mode transducer, which splits the two polarizations, uh, the horn and the two RF hybrids, the, the four superconducting mixers, the superconducting IF 90 degree hybrids, 
all of this is encapsulated in a single mixer block. And this has not been attempted before, but the idea is that this is the kind of assembly-wise construction which will be useful for scaling to future EHT receivers. And uh, this shows some of the design features of what we put together, uh, the horn, the OMT, the LO couplers, the 90 degree RF hybrids, all of this is in a single mixer block. And it's a compact design, allows you to build many of these elements uh, readily and deploy to various sites of this NGHT array. And uh, shown are some more details. Uh, the LO comes in through the back of the structure and uh, is coupled through a 17 dB coupler to the two uh, RF waveguides. And uh, shown are details of where the SIS channel will sit and the LO itself comes, as I said, through the back of the uh, block. Um, so to show you that this is real, this is a metal block that's been built and we're assembling the first SIS mixers on this and uh, about to test it within, this, uh, within March. And um, so the, the, the 230 gigahertz element is, is well in hand. Um, regarding the 345 gigahertz, uh, the 850 micron band, uh, this is where, at this point, there is no ongoing US development because the Alma Band 7 mixers are deployed in, in Europe. So within the EHT collaboration, the NGHT uh, groups, we are taking a longer view on this. And so we want to have a reliable supply of 345 gigahertz junctions. So for, to this end, we're, uh, have, we have a JPL contract out to fabricate these uh, junctions for 345 gigahertz. And so the JPL, a uh, team will work with us in fabricating these junctions and send us two prototype DSB SIS mixers, mixer blocks. And this will be done by the end of this year. And UMass will work Six with minutes. them. Six minutes, go for Six minutes. Thank you, Jono. And UMass will work with JPL in the uh, DC testing of these uh, uh, mixers and also the RF characterization. And we will then build a 2SB mixer block very similar to what I showed with the 230 gigahertz block just scale down. And uh, this will be built at UMass and integrated into the dual frequency receiver system. The JPL uh, specifications are also uh, similar to the 230 band, uh, four to 12 gigahertz IF. Uh, the, uh, the goal is to at least have eight gigahertz, but possibly larger. Noise temperature, again, a few times quantum limit, uh, five to six times quantum limit. And cyber and dejection ratio also to be uh, pretty high. Uh, so uh, to summarize, uh, the, the dual frequency effort is well at hand uh, for the LMT's uh, first prototype 230-345 gigahertz receiver. Uh, and as I said, it, it will feature dual polarization in both bands. It does put a more of an onus on the back end processing of this. Now you, you just have to process 128 gigahertz of uh, total bandwidth. Uh, this is going to be commissioned and installed in the LMT uh, in the 2022 to 23 season. Uh, the 345 gigahertz junctions uh, are developed as uh, part of the JPL collaboration that's in place right now. And as I said, uh, we hope that this is a prototype that can be used for all the smaller uh, additional telescopes in the NGHT. And I'll stop and wait for questions. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Gopal. Sounds like a fantastic receiver. Um, I, I might know a little bit about it in, in other contexts. Um, you have two minutes for questions. You're right on time. Uh, please raise your hand. We have one from Shep. Right, I'll, uh, oh, one from Shep. Okay, go ahead, Shep. Uh, Gopal, I, I may have missed this, but did you talk about the need for a chopper? Yes, and if, I, uh, I did. And, yeah, I, and, 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 and how, how transferable will that be to other, other dishes that are of different diameter or different form factor in the receiver cabin? Uh, it, in other words, are, are we taking into account the size of the ultimate NGHT dishes and their systems engineering as we think about these systems? Or is this purely, in your view, just a, uh, a prototype? No, oh, that's a great question, Chef. No, we are, we are thinking about the entire NGHT smaller dishes as well. The good news with this beam chopper is it's, uh, it's a chopping system uh, based right in front of the cryostat window. 
and and so it it is agnostic about the optics uh, of the of the smaller dish. Let's call it a six meter dish or a three and a half meter dish, whatever the dish sizes you are specifying. It, it's agnostic of that. Uh, and so this is a purely a beam chopper which spins a blade in front of the receiver. So you don't. Uh, this this can be completely transferable to other telescopes. But if you had a a mutating secondary, for example, as part of the design, I think that would be also very preferable and we can integrate that into that design as well. Okay, very quick last question from Jens. Sorry, you, this might be the same thing, a uh, question of terminology. Is this for calibrate chopper now, would that be for calibration or would this be for chopping on the sky? There are two, two, two reasons. Uh, people use choppers for two things, right? I mean, one is a cal chopper, and that's just for temperature cal calibrate, flux calibration of the system. Uh, the chopper that we're talking about here, Jens, is the beam chopper that could be used for doing continuum pointing. So a rapid pointing on, say, a quasar source, uh, chopping on and off, uh, move the beam uh, at, a, at a some cadence uh, uh, on and off the uh, source and thereby get a continuum value out of it. Would there be an issue well, in okay. installing yeah, so a ultra point in I, I actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off, Jens. Uh, okay. we, have to move, we have to move on. Uh, please take up questions unanswered in the Slack channel or uh, even on the chat. The Slack channel is more durable. Um, our, our next uh, speaker, thank you very much, Gopal. And thank our you. next speaker is uh, Leonid Gervitz uh, from, from JIVE, the, the Joint Institute for VLBI, ERIC and Delft University of Technology. I always thought it was the Joint Institute for VLBI in Europe, but I guess I was wrong. And uh, uh, Leonard's uh, talk is on the inevitability of the spaceborne extension of the EHT. So Leonard, please take it away, same ground rules. Thank you. So um, on the inevitability of spaceborne extension of EHT, um, well, uh, Vincent already made 51% uh, of the uh, job here and I'm doing remaining 49 uh, on behalf of a, a group of people uh, listed to the left side of uh, this um, uh, slide. Uh, this is so-called Theza collaboration and I'll explain what is Theza in, uh, in a minute. Uh, so, um, High angle resolution pushing the envelope. Uh, it's needless to uh, say in this audience that um, main driver for discoveries is uh, expanding parameter space. And HT brought in uh, excellent angle resolution at the uh, level of fringe spacing of 20 micro arc second, which was enough to get wonderful image of M87 and hopefully will produce something exciting about Sagittarius A. However, if you really want to push this um, parameter space further, and there are reasons to do so, you need to do something uh, with either baseline or wavelength. Now, if you want to go to a longer baseline beyond HT, and HT is now already a global facility, then inevitably you must go in space. There is no other solution. If you are, uh, want to stay with uh, uh, diameter of this planet and to go to higher frequency or shorter wavelength to increase your um, angular resolution. Again, you are limited by the atmosphere. And there is no way to beat this by to go beyond the atmosphere, therefore in space. So whatever you do, you, you go in space. There is no other way around. And by the way, there are many other attractions of doing a millimeter and submillimeter radio astronomy in space and astrometry. Uh, by means of LBI, as noted yesterday by Mark Reed, uh, you can think about micro arc second astrometry, but in space again, atmosphere stands on the way. And angular resolution exceeding Earth imposed limits, uh, it's uh, very attractive uh, for science. Many science applications do require that. And uh, so basically, we need a combination of EHT and space VLBI. In this sense, the heritage is very rich. Uh, in terms of space VLBI, there was a, a first demonstration by TDRSS, and then two dedicated missions via SOP and Radiostron, and Radiostron provided angle resolution down to 10 micro arc seconds. Of course, it's with some limitations. All these three things were Earth space VLBI systems. 
and for a millimeter and submillimeter single dish experiments. Well, plenty of them listed here on this slide, on the bottom part of this slide, and the technology developed there can be shared with our dream mission. So what our dream mission in response to the ESA call for voyage 2050, uh, a large uh, group uh, representing a community of VLBIs in Europe and elsewhere, uh, came up with the concept of terahertz exploration and zooming in for astrophysics, FASA in short. And this is one of white papers submitted uh, in response to Voyage 2050 call. It builds up uh, strongly on uh, space VLBI and millimeter submillimeter heritage, and it just pushes in the inevitable, in my opinion, direction uh, to microarch second resolution at terahertz frequencies. There are two sister concepts in the Voyage 2050 package. These are Origin Space Telescope or single dish spectrometry and far infrared uh, short baseline interferometry and leading uh, uh, authors of these two white papers, Martina Widner and Conrad Linz are actually co-authors of Thesia as well. We consider a uh, um, boundary uh, demonstration mission with parameters shown here uh, with the uh, uh, most important thing uh, and the resolution going down from the level uh, achievable by EHT on the ground. All that is actually described already in the paper published by um, uh, Freak Roloffs, uh, shown here in the uh, lower right corner. So uh, science case, well, primarily it's uh, uh, EHT science, but for many more sources. I remember that in the, uh, yesterday, Shep said that the ambition of NG EHT is to go uh, to um, uh, volume um, accessible by the system uh, larger 30 to 1,000 times. Well, that's wonderful, but still, this is a relatively small fraction of the universe we want to study. And there are much more supermassive black holes, which will be still, in terms of the angular size, below the limit of Earth-based NGHT. Again, you need to go in space to do statistics to beat back basically the formula, which is written here in the upper uh, right corner. Uh, and if you improve your angular resolution by order of magnitude, uh, uh, well, you will be able to do way more sources than those two which are in the center of our interest. Now, I'm going to do the trick suggested yesterday by Roger Blanford, not going the details of each slide uh, which follow, just uh, uh, titles of these slides. Of course, binary AGN and um, multi-messenger astronomy might be on the uh, list of uh, Theza uh, because, uh, again, angular resolution with the same sensitivity will bring a lot more sources than available now. The same goes for uh, transient sky and uh, even for water in the universe, something which is not on the agenda currently for EHT on the ground. Uh, now, how to do all that? Uh, we came up with a concept uh, which two now- minute uh, warning, uh, Two minute warning, you still get- Right. Uh, so it's just case study shown here, uh, two or three satellites on medium uh, um, uh, Earth orbit uh, with, uh, um, uh, UV coverage shown here over 40 hours, you get wonderful UV coverage in optimum direction, of course, but uh, these come with critical technologies for uh, Theza. Of course, you need affordable uh, terahertz optics, cry systems, receivers, precise synchronization, and uh, etc. and all these uh, bullets here. And all that will be a subject of engineering trade-offs, very serious. It's a piggyback launch uh, versus dedicated. Of course, it's a question of money. Getting raw data on the Earth for broadband correlation or to do something in orbit. Again, you put money either on the communication or processing in orbit. Observing with Earth-based telescopes like ALMA, of course, you gain in sensitivity or forget about ALMA and go really to terahertz, do something in space. And not least, it's about social sociology, community. Uh, you address something specifically for particular experiment or you offer a facility. All these are serious trade-offs, but they are uh, they certainly can be solved provided there is goodwill. 
finally, uh, two last slides is actually thinking aloud. How to do things we dream about. Most new things are basically forgotten old ones. Now let's remind ourselves there is a, a piece of hardware flying overhead, uh, which costs more than 100 billion now. This is ISS doing basically nothing for science for many years. I would like to remind that 20 plus years ago, there was a study conducted by ESA and RS Spatial how to use ISS to build up something to, to assemble a large antenna and then to push it away for um, free flying experiments for VLBI or radio astronomy. Well, they didn't uh, get through. Nevertheless, this idea might be coupled now with something which actually belongs to EHT consortium. This is uh, Amoeba or I, uh, YTLA antenna, uh, which was built by ICR, member of EHT. 13 1.2 meter antennas, wide band around 100 gigahertz. Now, if you just put instead of single big antenna like that and assemble case, uh, case by case. Uh, so delivering small antennas, assemble them together. Once they are together and phased up, you just uh, uh, push this gently away from a space station or another base and you have wonderful telescope in space. You do this several times and you have something which would be what we would talk about. It's expandable, it's um, assemblable, it can be tested and only then put uh, in operation, no need for deep space placement and must be international and highly uh, synergistic I, I, to other things. Apologies for that. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Zoom. Um, okay. Okay. And uh, Ted uh, um, Huang is, is from the Academia Sinica Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, his talk is on the status of the Asia A345 gigahertz receiver for VLBI. So Jonas, uh, I will do the talk for Ted. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, Ming Tang Chen is, is speaking for, for Ted. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Leonard, can you please unshare your screen so that, uh, there we go. Uh, please, please go ahead, uh, Ming Tang, and, and you have, uh, you have uh, eight minutes for two for questions. All right. Uh, uh, this is a second talk about the uh, the instrumentation, particularly the receiver. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, the 345 gigahertz receiver that uh, that we are working on. Um, so this is part of the uh, the Greenland Telescope project. That uh, this first slide that you see is the uh, the telescope currently in Thule, uh, north northeast northwest corner of Greenland. Um, let's see. Oops. Where is it? Okay, so this is nighttime, 12 meter ALMA prototype. Uh, so this is the, uh, the receiver cabin. Uh, what you see that this is uh, one of the receiver, uh, our three cartridge receivers near the, uh, the cassegrain focus. Um, so cartridge is basically the, uh, the button mounted. It's ALMA, oh, well, so, this is the, uh, we have actually two uh, crash that, two set of crash that um, one is in Thule for Greenland. Um, we have a backup crash that system that's sitting in JCMT right now. It has been commissioned, um, is uh, operating um, not too long ago. So this is red thing here. Uh, we call it a red fish with the big eyes. Um, the, uh, the left, Photo is uh, when it opened up, it's configurations like that. So uh, our first first slide receiver that the uh, the receiver system we've been doing, particularly on the 345 gigahertz, we have purchased two sets of EROM Ben 7 um, ALMA receivers. So one is in Thule and one is in Hawaii, JCMT now. But, uh, well, I think it's, uh, it's the motivation for us to, to, to develop our own is that the, 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 uh, it's, hard, it's difficult. People, are, manpower is, uh, it's not easy to get service from Iran to, uh, to work on the, uh, if we have any, any uh, receiver issue. So uh, we decided to uh, develop our own. Uh, it will be a, a completely all multi-compatible um, 
It's based on AMA Band 7 develop, development, but we have made some modification. Um, we can do this because we, uh, we, have, we have our experience in SMA as a millimeter array. We have the uh, junction fabrication capability, receiver development capability. We also have the AMA, the uh, front end integration ex experience. Um, so we developed this, we can support the GLT and also JCMT on the single, single dish and um, also VLBI projects. Also that the future development that we're into a high frequency or multi-frequency receiver. Uh, as you can see that this is not a, a breakthrough development in receiver technology, but our aim is just to, uh, to work on something that is reliable, that we can um, start getting science, getting photon out of the, the, the current telescopes right now. So the progress right now, uh, we have uh, pretty much finalized the design last year. Uh, fabrication drawing is, has been ready last month. Uh, we are waiting for parts to come back to Taipei in March. Uh, we, sh we should start the integration and testing uh, before August this year. So I'll show you this is the, uh, the, the model of the so what we what we have. Um, so the optic will be the uh, one piece machining structure, and there will be a single feed home. Uh, this is uh, different from the Benz, Alma Benz Seven. Benz Seven has two feed home. We have single feed home, and with uh, with OMT design. Um, specification is very similar to Alma. We have the uh, we, we want to build something that's at least compatible to, to that. Otherwise, there's no point to build it. Um, I'll show you some details. So this is the optics design. Uh, it's nothing really fancy. So two mirror here, single v Um This is uh, similar to Alma Band 7 design, but except that at the end, we have a circular output um, and then come out with, uh, there will be a transition from circular to uh, Square, um, so that we can we can perform the two um, two linear polarization. We're working our our OMT right now. Uh, this performance like this component has been made. So uh, this is what it would look like. Uh, it's bulky, not like Copel. That's Copel. It's a very uh, Copel design is very compact, but uh, we. Uh, we, we don't want to, uh, we, we, we want to have something that's quick and fast. So that's why we, we decided to do a Lego style uh, receiver mixer. Um, it, we fabricated this as I mix ourselves. Um, this, we have, to, currently we pick up some, something we made for SAO, for the SMA back in 2013. Um, we are making something newer. Uh, should be better than this. Uh, some component. So this is the uh, IF hybrid, uh, called LNA from no, low noise factory, uh, component mixer blocks. Um, this is very uh, SMA similar. So um, I think we're making progress on this. Um, we are fairly confident that we should be able to make something out um, to demonstrate something by the end of the year. Um, so that's, that's our work. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Ming Tang. Um, so there, there is time for questions. Uh, again, uh, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, if you have a question. Um, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll ask a, I'll ask a practical question. Um, uh, when, when will this uh, 345 gigahertz receiver be, be fitted? Uh, to the telescope, and uh, I think we like to uh, we like to point into the, the sky, uh, put it into 
we should be able to do it. Let's see. I think not in this summer. We we would like to do it after the next EHT campaign. That would be two thousand okay. twenty twenty two, right? I mean twenty one. Twenty twenty. Okay. Right. We I don't think we will be ready in the summer. So we probably will have to wait till the next one, twenty twenty two EHT campaign campaign. Then we can offer it in either in JCMT or or GLT. We actually have problems with both. Iran uh, cartridge right now. Uh, one, both has one. One of the channel has some uh, uh, issues, so that's why we we need this right now in order to do two authorization. Actually, it's it's interesting that you mentioned testing with uh, JCMT uh, because I believe that that's what was done with the with the GLT one point three millimeter receiver. Uh, in, yes. In fact, I, I was. A part of that, the, the VLDI fringes were obtained at JCMT before the, the telescope, uh, before the receiver was shipped. Uh, oh, the back, in 2000, back in 2017. So yeah, once yeah, it yeah. Test, and, and, tested, it should be too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which is a very good idea because Tuli is so far away, out of the way. Um, Gopal has put his hand up. Uh, please, please go ahead, Gopal. Yeah. Um... Ming-Tang, I, I think I may have asked this question in a different context to you before, but I do not remember the answer to this. Uh, these SIS junctions uh, that you fabricated yourself, could you remind me how many, uh, is it a series array or a single SIS junction inside of it? I think it's a, it's a series of, of junctions. Okay. It's, and it's not a distributed line, it's a, it's a, it's a two or four okay. junctions. And, and is it, is it uh, have you already demonstrated the full IF bandwidth uh, or is it still that test is to be done? Oh, not yet. Uh, okay. we, haven't, we haven't got to that far yet, but it's, it's almost there now. Okay. I'll show uh, you uh, where, where we have it. Okay. Okay. Very Th good. Thanks, thank uh, you. thanks Gopal, and, and, and thank you, uh, Ming Tang, for a very interesting talk. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to Ilsa and Laurent, and then uh, we can try again, Leonard, at the end, if, if you don't mind, um, and and see if we get any further. So um, Ilsa van Bemmel is also at uh, Jive, uh, and uh, she has a presentation today uh, on um, operational software development. Uh, so same rules again, uh, Elsa. Yeah, I, I can't uh, I, share at the moment because somebody else is. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry, Laurent, yeah. you're not not up just yet. Okay, okay. so you you should go. be able to share now. Sorry. Sorry about that. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Can you let me know if you see the slide or the. Uh, presenter view. I actually, I actually see the presenter view. Does this fix it? Um, much better. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk. And slight apologies in advance. I'll be about half a minute longer than the eight minutes, but I couldn't get myself to do any shorter. Uh, so to focus a little bit on uh, some of the things that Lindy presented yesterday, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the calibration software design for the NGEHT. And as uh, Jonathan just mentioned, I'm also from Jive. And Jonathan, you were right, until about April 2015, the E stood for Europe. Um, but it's now an ERIC, which is a research foundation system in Europe that we uh, exploit. So the Jive is the central organization for the uh, European Field BI network. And as you can see from this image, we're no longer limited to Europe, but actually it's a global telescope system, very much hybrid to different types of telescopes. So in that context, fairly similar to the design for the NGEHT, except that we operate at centimeter wavelengths. And at that level, at that frequency, we still provide the sharpest view of the universe. And as organization, Jive actually supports the EVN in almost every aspect. So we help people write their proposal calls, we schedule the observations, we do the correlation, quality control, and even a rudimentary pipeline processing. And if a PI is a real newbie for VLBI data processing, we help them with the calibration and imaging almost up to the point that they start writing their papers. So it's quite an extensive level of support. And this is actually what brought me to ask uh, a quick question. If you can look at the Slack channel, there is a pinned question. 
um, because it's not there's no time to do this live in uh, in eight minutes. But the, the question actually is who can reduce field BI data? And there's a lot of a few more options, but the general point I would want to make here is that there is very few people who can completely process field BI data all by themselves. Actually, the few suspects that I would expect were the ones who answer that they can actually do that. And of course they can, but the majority of people will need help at different levels. In addition to this, we see a trend in astronomy that more and more observatories are moving to providing science ready data. This means that as an astronomer, you propose and you get your data completely processed and calibrated to the best of the abilities. Now, this is a trend that, that has started a decade ago and Alma is a great example of how you can set this up. And you see a split in capabilities. People who are really good at calibration will start doing only calibration. The scientists who are much better at doing science will no longer have to bother with all sorts of technical aspects and just do the science. And that way you just optimize the return of your system. So that also means there is a choice. And there was already some discussion yesterday about how to set up the NGEHT. And the choice at this point for calibration, what you want to make and what you want to make at a rather early stage is on which support level are we going to provide to the users? And this ties in with a very high level decision of how are we going to set up this project? And there's basically two extremes. It's not a right or wrong. Um, and this is not one or the other, but of course there's a, uh, a whole uh, spectrum of, of solutions that you can think of. I think the main point I want to make here is that if you make a choice, you also exclude some other options downstream. So it's very important to think this through and do it properly. And as Shep mentioned yesterday, you can do an experiment and do razor sharp science. And that's relatively cheap, but it also implies that you really can do only that type of science and maybe a few spin-off projects, but you're quite limited. It's high risk, but also very high gain. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got an observatory like you're operating in Jive. That's expensive. It, re it requires consistent and continuous funding, but at the benefit that you can hire permanent staff build up experience and extensive support to all sorts of users and a wide range of user science. So the choice that you make, as I said, there's no right or wrong. There's different levels that you have to discuss. And this is the point where NGEHT now needs to start thinking about what we're going to do. But this will impact not just the support level that you can provide, but also the choice of the software that you're going to use. <coughs> Sorry. We went through this in Jive a couple of years ago at the start of our involvement with the Black Hole Camp project, when we were asked to help them construct a pipeline for millimeter field BI data processing. So immediately our take was we could do this in CASA because CASA is widely used around the world and used for many different science cases. And it would also benefit us to have a pipeline for the EVM. But there's other packages around. So we did not just jump to that opportunity saying, go, we're going ahead with CAS. So we did a very extensive analysis of a range of different software packages to make sure that this was really the best option for us. And in retrospect, it turns out we were right that indeed CASA was the best option for many, many reasons, um, but it is strongly future-proof. It will be around for decades. There's a strong future vision in the CASA development team. It has an extensive help desk it has a very fantastic development team and we get all that for free and all we have to do from Jive site is make sure that we get the tools implemented that we need for VLBI data processing. So really good cost benefit and relatively small investment. We now have VLBI capabilities in CASA. Now that's a choice that we made coming from our background as an observatory. We need that long term perspective. For NGEHT this may be different and I know that people are looking into redeveloping hops. And this is a very interesting project in itself. Um, but I also hope that this choice is made from a wider background and an assessment of the, the needs that are going to be around for NGEHT. And for example, uh, the new functionality that is going to be required for the dual frequency or maybe even a space-based station may actually mean that HOPS is a better choice than a large and somewhat clunky package like CASA. Two minutes. But this, this, thank you. So, so these are all choices to consider. And this choice of software not only ties you down to a certain package, but makes has a lot of other consequences. For example, the data format that you want to use and how you are going to get your users uh, joining you up for actually doing the data processing. 
So as an example, I wanted to briefly highlight what we're doing in Jive. Uh, we're working in the ESCAPE project, which is a European-based project to work towards a fair data access policy. So we've made our data findable. We've only just worked to, uh, to launch a PO tab service, which is still very experimental. The data is accessible through the EVN archive. Interoperable does not really apply to us very much. But I think for me, as a SciCom from the science side, reusable and reproducibility is really key to this. So we're working towards a science platform, which consists of a Jupyter Hub, basically means as a user, you can log into that Jupyter Hub, which runs on machines in Jive. You get your data there. Associated with your data is a Jupyter Notebook. And this Jupyter Notebook has all the CASA steps that have been run as part of the science support quality control. And you can rerun that notebook and check if you're happy with the results. Or you can change things in that notebook and improve on the calibration. And we already see that this is already helping our support staff identifying issues. If a user does something wrong, they just look at the notebook, identify which parameter was uh, the problem, change it, and explain to the user how to improve this. So I see, unfortunately, as I was, I was sort of expecting, I'm running out of time. So I can't really show you what the notebook looks like, but I'll make sure there is a link in the Slack channel. There is a prototype EVN notebook available that you can have a look at. And this is something that we've done to really bridge that gap between the software development and the users who have to use it, because we can all dream, but science ready data products for field BI data is going to be a while away. So all these choices, and I hope uh, people will have some thoughts about this, and I would really welcome further discussion on this, and I think I'll cut it up here. Thank you. Uh, excellent, Dilsa. Thank you very much. Um, virtual applause uh, to you. Um, we have time for one question, and I will also point people to Ilsa's survey uh, on the Slack channel, uh, where you find the questions and you, you add an emoticon to it. Uh, so uh, one question uh, for, for Ilsa, if there is one. Uh, all right, I'll I'll uh, take chair's privilege, and I'll I'll just quickly ask whether, you know, something like a Jupyter notebook uh, would work well with a tutorial session. Uh, do you have any plans, perhaps, to to schedule something where you might teach people how to use this um, calibration method? Yeah, actually, um, we had a uh, Casa Fibri Data School last November. Um, where we used this Jupyter notebook. It was in a slightly more rudimentary stage at the time, but it does prove to be very useful for this kind of purpose. Um, on the other hand, we also noticed that this is really benefiting the user interaction, but for internal pipelining, where we really want things to go as automated as possible, um, this is not the ideal option. So it's, uh, and, and actually you, you may be aware that Michael Janssen wrote the uh, RP card pipeline based in CASA, and this may be something that was much more applicable to a, a very dedicated type of operations where you really need to do one thing very well. Uh, and I noticed Kazu put his hand up. Really quick one, Kazu, if you can. Uh, yeah, actually, I already posted a question in Slack. But um, yeah, I, I have a just quick question regarding the CASA lifetime. Um, you know, I, I know now the next generation CASA has been designed and developed, you know, driven by NGBLA. And uh, so in the NGHD timescale, I guess say it's 10 years from now. Actually, which of the present CASA or NGH, NG CASA is, is the likely platform for you know, via VI or community-wide you know, radio interferometric data reduction? Um, if I get your question right, you're asking if, if NG CASA would be uh, the, the best thing for NG EHT in, the, in 10 years from now. And I think that remains to be seen. The, the current status of the NGCASA is still very much in, uh, in its infancy and they're having really good ideas, but also they are very much gearing towards the high data rates and high data volumes data processing, um, which compared to NGEHD, in spite of all the expanding uh, uh, the technology expansions may not be the best option. But I think that's, that's exactly my point. You want to make sure that you, you make your choice based on uh, a proper requirement set and not just because you like the software. Okay, thanks very much, um, Ilsa. Um, and we'll move on to our uh, last presentation, apart from a, a do-over uh, with Leonard. 
uh, we could try one more time, but uh, our, our last speaker, uh, that aside is uh, Laurent Lenard uh, from UNAM. I won't attempt to pronounce the spelled out institution. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the uh, Mexican participation in the NGHD. Uh, and please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So it's going to be a very short talk, actually, because I, I had hoped when I registered for this meeting that I would actually have results to show. But unfortunately, uh, COVID got in the way, so I, I'm just going to uh, describe what the plans are for uh, for uh, the National University of Mexico in terms of the uh, NGEHT, and also explain a little bit how that fits with other projects that we are uh, that we are involved with. So just a bit of um, of background. Uh, there, there are essentially two places uh, or two large places in Mexico where radio astronomy is is being worked on. One is the INAOE, the Institute for Nas the National Institute for Astronomy, Optics, and Electronics, which uh, is the, the institution that operates the, uh, the Large Millimeter Telescope, as you all know. And and there, so scientifically, historically, the, the um, approach is more focused on single dish millimeter astronomy. That that's what the LMT was built to do initially. And then, in parallel, the National University where I work and where a number of us work. Uh, has been historically more focused on on the centimeter part of the way of the uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum and on interferometry both connected with the VLA and and VLBI also uh, so the, those are the two main uh, groups of radio astronomers in Mexico and uh, more recently or recently in the last five years more or less we have been increasingly involved with the uh, NGVLA, the Next Generation Very Large Array, which is currently undergoing review at the, uh, the Canal Review in the US. Uh, we are involved both from the technical point of view and on the scientific um, uh, aspect. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the current design for the NGVLA uh, includes three stations uh, that, that are uh, in Northern Mexico, somewhere between the states of uh, uh, Chihuahua and Sonora. Uh, and there's also been uh, some discussion about the possibility of using one of the, long, this, this central part here is the central part of the uh, NGVLA, but the NGVLA will also include very long baselines, 1,000 kilometer baselines. And there's been some discussion about the idea of putting one of these stations in Baja California. So that brings me to the, to the observatory that uh, the, National University operates in Baja California. It's located uh, here on the peninsula of Baja California uh, in a national park called San Pedro Martí. Uh, and this is a site uh, with uh, a res respectable um, altitude, about 9,000 meters above sea level. Um, it's uh, compared to the, to the uh, NGBA location, it's uh, almost exactly due west from, from that location. Um, and the, the observatory in San Pedro Martir has about half a dozen uh, different telescopes, instruments. Among them, uh, the two that I'm showing here, just as example, one dedicated to the study of exoplanets called Centex. Um, and the other one is a, is a large field uh, optical transient imager. So what they do there is they try to find counterparts to um, transients of, of any kind, but in particular gamma ray bursts. Uh, to, to do, then do the follow-up and, um, and uh, identify the kind of object that this is. Um, th this has a 10 square degrees field of view, so it's a very large part of the sky observed uh, constantly in different filters. So uh, in, in that recent paper, Alex Raymond looked at uh, a large number of possible sites that could be added to the current EHD, uh, more than 40 of them and identified more than a dozen that would be particularly interesting in, term, in terms of uh, good weather, uh, good location for filling up the UV plane, already having infrastructure locally uh, that can be uh, tacked on for electricity and all, all the you know, internet, et cetera. And one of those sites is precisely this site in Baja. Uh, so, so our um, goal over the next decade or so would be to have a, a dish in Baja, uh, perhaps a recycled Bima dish, or perhaps a new dish, a larger one, uh, that will be installed on that observatory. As we all know, this would allow 
together with all the other sites, this would allow a uh, large uh, improvement to the, to the images that we can make of an 87. Uh, so the plan was to start site testing for, uh, you know, to, to characterize better the, the weather conditions on the site during 2020, but unfortunately uh, COVID got on the way. So this has to be, this had to be uh, postponed. The, the observatory is currently closed. Uh, so we haven't been able to, to do that, but we hope that we'll be able to uh, retake these activities in the near future. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Laurent. Uh, uh, you, you were quite short, uh, as you promised. I know. Um, and, and, and I have to say that, uh, which is very helpful actually considering our technical difficulties um, and just being generally over. I have to say that San Pedro de Martia looks absolutely spectacular. I want to go. Um, uh, Chef has a question for you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Laurent, really nice. Uh, the first time I've actually seen it in the snow like this. So, really kind of interesting. Can you comment on the funding landscape? Uh, you know, we, we, we've talked, of, of course, about doing some site testing up there with the infrared devices that Alex Raymond has done and maybe with a water vapor radiometer. Um, but uh, did you want to say a few words about uh, the funding climate uh, for such a deployment, for deployment of such a dish? Yes, so, so before I do that, I, I want to add that not only is San Pedro beautiful, it also has great food. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a very nice place to visit. Um, I, I should have uh, mentioned also in my talk that, uh, in fact, precisely because of the activity related to the NGVLA, we are also uh, developing uh, radiometers here in our institute. And, and one of the plans was to deploy one of them uh, to the site uh, last year, but again, this had to be cancelled. So the, the, the financial climate is not great, to say the least. Um, the situation is complicated at the moment. It's, it's not uh, clear uh, how the economy will recover, how quickly the economy will recover after the, the COVID crisis. The government is also not, at the current government is, is not uh, particularly friendly to science. Uh, so this doesn't look really good for the next few years. But here governments change every six years. So, in, you know, in, on a time scale of five years, I'm, I'm hopeful that the situation might improve. Uh, can I ask a quick question? question? Can I ask a quick uh, question? Very quick. Sure. Laurent, I was I was uh, there once in the uh, in spring, but okay. um, what about the climates? The uh, the uh, millimeter climates is that only good for winter, or is it going to be good for the uh, typical GHT sessions or the NGHT sessions we have now? So I, th I think it's okay. I think it's okay for, for, for the year around. There, there are moments, uh, I, I don't actually have that information clear in my head at the moment, but uh, there, there are months in the year that, that are not so good, but I think for uh, the early spring, it, it would be okay. Yes. Uh, Alex's paper, I believe, has some seasonal information yes, in it. Yes. Uh, 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 yes. Hi, Laurent, nice seeing you. Um, Quick question, maybe you covered that and I forgot and I just didn't get it. Who would be the partner organization for this? Hi, Jens. Nice to meet you too. Nice to see you too. Uh, it, it would be the, the university itself. So the, the, um, uh, uh, the observatory is owned and operated by the university itself and funded by the university itself. Ultimately, the funds are coming from the federal government, but uh, the university is autonomous in its uh, use of the funds. Uh, thanks very much. Last quick question from Gopal, and uh, and then we'll wrap things up. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, Laurent. Uh, great talk. Uh, I think there was uh, some archival data on San Pedro Martir from the time when uh, we were doing site testing for the LMT back in the 90s. Can you confirm if that is the case or not? That, that's a rumor that I've heard. In the yeah. I haven't been able to confirm that it is true or to get my hands on the data, but I, uh, I think David Iriart is the- is the David, yeah, David is the person to talk to, Hiriad. Yeah. 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 Okay. It, it was certain, sorry, let uh, me just that, interrupt. It was certainly one of the sites 
that was considered as a potential LMT site. So it's just a matter of does David still have the data? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. In any case, um, we want uh, to, to complement them with more recent uh, observations. 